Alright, so finally let's make this texture surface to the 3D rows. I used the code at the last moment of the part 1, so you don't necessarily have to follow the part 1.5. So essentially what we're gonna do is connecting each 4 vertices of the 3D rows, then create planes on that. They are columns and rows, the two-dimensional structure, so to store all the vertices, I want to use a 2D array. So I make an array V, and also make columns and rows. And in the next loop, I replace this one and this 15 pi to rows and curves. And yes, that went crazy because the range limit was changed to these values. Uh, we need to fix that. So I make other two variables, then assign the original range of the theta and r, divided by the curves and columns. The variable names represent the theta and r density. So I multiply all the theta and r inside this nested loop by the values. So I multiply all the theta by the td. And I also multiply all the r by the rd. Yeah, just like that. And in addition, I change the increment step in the nested loop to 1. Alright, let's reload it. Hmm, alright, we see the outline of the rows again, but... Hmm, there are some jets like coming out of black hole. We see this byproduct because the theta range has some negative values. In the part 1, we set this theta range starting from minus 2 pi to create these extra elements. Can you see that? That resembles the flower sepals. Here. But um, in this video, I don't need that anymore. I changed this theta range just starting from 0. Okay. Alright, now it's gone. So now there is no negative values in the theta range, so we actually don't need this restriction anymore. I reload it again. Alright. Now I remove this vertex function and also this begin shape and end shape. Instead, at here, I store a blank small array inside the array V. At this moment, the array V just becomes a 2D array. Also, inside the nested loop, I create a vector to contain the XYZ coordinates. Then I store the vector in the small array I just pushed inside the 2D array. We iterate that through all the vertices. And lastly, we initialize the V to empty. Okay, now let's make sure that everything is okay. So I type console.log to output the 2D array V. Alright, this is it. If I open this, yep, we see the two dimensional structure here, right? So let's extract some array and make sure the XYZ coordinates are here. Alright, that looks working. Okay, so right after this nested loop, we write another nested loop to access all the vertices we just stored. So inside here, we're gonna connect to each four closest point. So let's pick a random four vertices. If the index of this vertex in the 2D array is VR theta, then what's the index of this vertex at above? It's gonna be VR plus one theta, right? And this one is V r plus 1, theta plus 1. And the last one is v r theta plus 1, right? So we write like so. First I set some constraints not to get the error. Inside of the constraint I make begin shape and end shape. Then connect to the four vertices. Hmm, that looks awesome. Actually, I changed this to fill. And I want to remove the line mesh, so I changed this to no stroke. Hmm, beautiful. Oh, by the way, in case you don't need the sliders, you're just happy to have this result without making them interactive, then you don't have to assign the vertices to the 2D array at every single frame in the draw function. You just need to do once in the setup, like this. 
Oh, uh, why I don't see anything? Uh, oh, yeah, because I initialized the array here, so I delete this funnel. Hmm, it just works fine. Oh, I forgot one important thing to mention. To make this tutorial series, I got help from many people. When I had a mathematical program to port the equations into JavaScript from another language, I asked a question on Stack Overflow, and one guy took a lot of time and helped me a lot. So now I fully understand how the equations are working. When I tried to make the sharp petal shape, like which I showed you in the part 1.5, I posted a question on Facebook group. And I actually got comments from dozens of people. <laughs> yeah, really, actually. They shared their own equation or an idea for me. So without their help, I couldn't provide these tutorials for you. So I gotta say thank you to all those people. Alright, back to the coding. Now we're gonna make it controllable with sliders. So there are several parameters in the equation I want to put a slider. But um, at first I make two sliders for these two values. Here. Okay, this value is responsible for openness of the petal. You see that? And this value is for vertical density. So let's do that. First I declare four variables. These two are to store the two sliders, and the other two are for the text that will be displayed right above the sliders. Then in the setup function, I create sliders and div elements for containing the text. These four values indicate mean, max, default, and increment step. Next, at this nested loop in the setup function, I replace the corresponding values with the slider values. And in the draw function, I display the slider values in the div element. Alright, now we can move the sliders, the values are updating. Hmm, but the rows itself is not changing because I moved this part into the setup function. So I need to bring this back to the draw function, like before, above this, yeah. Okay, and don't forget initializing the 2D array at the last in the draw function. Alright, let's reload it. Hmm, now it's working beautifully. But uh, I changed this increment step to 0.1, I guess that's very enough. I also want to make sliders for this value responsible for the petal align, and two values responsible for a petal hanging down. So I declared these variables, and I duplicate the sliders. I set each four values, mean, max, default, increment step to some reasonable amount. Alright, I assign all of them to corresponding terms in the equations. Display all the text associated with the sliders. Alright, let's reload it. Alright, that's working beautifully. If you want to make them look better by CSS, watch this. I make a variable canvas, and I set CSS ID for the canvas. I also set the classes for the sliders. Alright, then let's prepare the classes in the CSS file. Yeah, I actually already have them in my CSS. And this is for the HTML page. I set the background color as bluish white color. Okay. And this one is for the P5 canvas here. And this one is for the text, uh, the right up of the sliders. And this one is for the slider itself. 
And the last one is for the slider handles. This one. So let's reload this CSS file and this sketch.js as well. Oh, now we don't see the sliders. I actually move them out here by the CSS. Oh, I want to make the resolution a bit lower. Like, okay. Let's move it. Mm, all right, looks it's working fine. I just realized that I need to fix the text a little bit. At the draw function, I put a colon and a space between the text and the values. Okay, now it's fine. Lastly, I want to make the pfabjs background transparent by this clear function. Yeah, I personally like this. By the way, if you are interested to play around with geometry, I have another video showing what errors we can create with spherical coordinate system. So that's at the top right here.